stop hard coding your values inside of your ASP.NET Core applications. Seriously, we have better options that we can use for this sort of thing. Hi, my name is Nick Cosentino, and I'm a Principal Software Engineering Manager at Microsoft. If you've found that you keep hard coding strings in different parts of your application, and that if you want to go change these things, you really have to either go rebuild your code or redeploy your applications, don't worry, there's a better solution than having to do that. In this video, I'm going to walk you through the iOptions and iOptions monitor interfaces that we have access to that make this a lot easier for us. A quick reminder that if you like this kind of content, subscribe to the channel and check out that pinned comment for my courses on Dome Train. With that said, let's jump over to Visual Studio and check out a very simple ASP.NET Core app and what we can do here. All right, so on my screen, what I've done is I've started with the weather forecast sample application that we get from Visual Studio. I stripped out all of the code that's not necessary and transformed the one route that we have into a hello get request that we can make. And you'll notice that it doesn't do a whole lot. It's very simple and it's using minimal APIs here. What I'm doing for this route is I have a new object that I'm returning. It's going to have a string that's hard coded as well as an integer here that's hard coded as well. So what we're going to look at is if I go run this, it's not going to be very surprising, but if I get it going here and pull it up on my screen, we can see that I do get a JSON response that has string as the name for this one with some string, right? It's the values that are hard coded here in the route and integers 420. And if I want to go change these, the only way to go do that right now is that I have to go basically into the code. I can go 1337 here. And if I wanted to have this take effect, I would have to go rebuild and redeploy my application if this were in production. Obviously, running from Visual Studio makes this extremely trivial, right? I just press play. But the point here is I have to go change the code because it's been hard coded in. And if you have different things like that that are in your application and you want to start decoupling the build and release and deployment process from being able to make these types of changes, there's something better that we can do here. What I'd like to do now is introduce this idea of I options. And what we're able to do with I options is start pulling data out of our app settings JSON file. So if you're not familiar with that, I'm going to jump over to app settings JSON on the left side of Visual Studio here in the Solution Explorer. And you'll see that I've added in, and if you're not familiar with this, I guess I should mention the rest of this stuff that you see right now is what came by default. And what I've done is added in this settings section. It's hierarchical, right? So I have settings and then I have some properties inside of it. And what I'm going to do is basically allow us to pull this data out of this file so that we can leverage it in our application. Therefore, not hard coding things, so we don't have to go rebuild our application, but we will have a configuration file that we could put onto the machine instead. There are gonna be some drawbacks still, it's not gonna get us all the way there, but this is just a stepping stone to not have it hard-coded in the code. Before we move on, this is just a reminder that I do have courses available on Dome Train if you wanna level up in your C-sharp programming. If you head over to Dome Train, you can see that I have a course bundle that has my getting started and deep dive courses on C-sharp. Between the two of these, that's 11 hours of programming in the C-sharp language, taking you from absolutely no programming experience to being able to build basic applications. You'll learn everything about variables, loops, a bit of async programming, and object-oriented programming as well. Make sure to check it out. You'll see that I do have the string property, integer property that I want to be able to represent. I put some different values in here, right? So this is the string in 123. If we go back to the code, that's different than what we saw with some string in 1337. I've done that just to show you that we will be taking on these new values. So what I'm doing is I'm going to allow us using the dependency injection framework, we can ask for I options and I have to go make this settings option type now. What I would like to do, and spoiler alert, this doesn't work, we'll see why in just a moment, is I'd like to introduce a record type here called settings options, and then I will have the string property and integer property as well that we can work with, but this won't work. I will show you very soon. What we need to do beyond just doing this is basically allow us to get this from dependency injection. So I do have to go add in on the dependency injection part up at the top that we want to configure settings options and it's going to pull from the section called settings. And again, just to show you, if I go back to app settings, settings, that name that we saw in the code is what we're like the area, the section essentially that we're pulling from in this app settings JSON file. This part allows us to get the mapping in dependency injection. And then we'll see here that on the minimal API, dependency injection is going to be able to provide this for us so that we can ask for it. 
Now that means what we can do is ask for settings dot ask for the value and then we can get the string property here. Then we can do the same thing, but we can ask for the integer property on the second one. Now, if I go run this, we should be able to see that we get the values pulled directly from the app settings config file. And surprise, like I said, it's actually not going to work because we can't use the record, right? I mentioned that before. So this is what I would want to do, but we can't use records and it's because we need to be able to have a public parameterless constructor. So this option, even though it seems like a very good fit, is out. We can't use that. But what we can do is use a class. We can use a class with init instead of setters on here. So if we want to be able to create this instance and not have public setters on them, we can use init. So during object initialization, this can get set. So if I go run this now, we should see that in fact, this does work. And there we go. So we see this is the string in integer one, two, three, that's being pulled right from here. So lines 14 and 15 and to prove it, right? So this is the string integer one, two, three, we can see this is the string and integer of one, two, three. So essentially what we've been able to do is configure dependency injection to have settings options. This class that we've created map to a section, right? That's what this part does in our app settings JSON file. Then we use dependency injection to pass them back as the response. And of course, we can do other things with this. So if you wanted to be able to configure logging, right, that's actually what we see inside of app settings JSON. One of the major purposes for this is that you can change logging without having to go rebuild your application. But there are tons of other things that you might want to be able to configure without a whole rebuild. You might be saying, Nick, you did say there was going to be a drawback to this still. It's not going to get us all the way. And what did you mean by that? It's a great question because we're going to jump into that next. The problem is still that we need to be able to restart our application. So you'd need to be able to go essentially push this file to wherever your server is running, restart the application for it to go take on the new settings. But we do have a little trick that we can do to go improve this. And that's going to be using iOptionsMonitor. If I go back to the code here, so on line 10, I can change iOptions to iOptionsMonitor. And now one more thing that we have to go do is not ask for value, but instead we ask for the current value. And I'll do that in both spots here. Now what we're able to do is restart this thing and it's going to look very similar, right? It's not going to be that exciting. It's basically going to be the last results we just saw. So you say, Hey Nick, that didn't do anything, but something cool that we can do now is if I keep this thing running, if I go back to app settings, JSON, and I put in uh, 1337 here, and then I put in dev leader for this part, right? I save that. If I go back to here, you saw that I didn't restart the application. I didn't rebuild anything. Press enter. Boom. We can pull these in without having to restart anything in your setup. Again, I don't know what your environment looks like, how you're deploying all these things. That's for you to figure out. But what we're able to do is basically have a way to push this file to where your server is running. And then this is able to dynamically reload for us and pull stuff from the config file. Something that you'll still want to keep in mind, even with this in place, is you may have things that were configured on startup or those values were cached at startup when they were pulled from the config file. And even if you do something like this, essentially your code is not actually going back to the I configuration or the I options in this case. What it's doing is just reading your cached value. In those particular cases, you wouldn't be getting this sort of hot reload functionality and you may have to go consider what things you do want to have hot reload and what things you do want to basically cache and have as a one-time setup. It's just something important to keep in mind because it's not like automatically by going to I options monitor, suddenly everything in your program will dynamically change. There might be some things that you don't want to dynamically change or some things that you designed in a way that are very difficult to dynamically change, even though you can read the config on the fly. You might have to rebuild big parts of your application in code at runtime to be able to go say, hey, look, the config changed. Let's go reconstruct all these objects. This is a tool that you can leverage if you are sort of deep in your application design and that you're not ready to support this. It might be something you can consider for next time or think about refactoring parts of your code to be able to get you to leverage this if it's going to be helpful. Now, for some of my smaller projects that I go create, if I have some downtime because I need to go basically redeploy a whole server, it's not a real big deal, but if you're running real systems and you need to keep that uptime, you may want to consider something like this because you don't technically have to have downtime to go reload that config. If you thought this was interesting and you want to see more about building ASP.NET Core applications, you can check out this video next. Thanks, and I'll see you next time.